<clears throat> so, my name Fabian means bean grower, and I'm not. I'm incredibly good with people, and the last 30 years has been spent talking to, working with, facilitating, guiding, writing about leadership in many parts of our world. Uh, as recently as three weeks ago, I was a speaker at a global leadership conference with 21 of the most significant contributors to the leadership debate in the world. 21 speakers, three women. Four days, all three women were in the graveyard shift. You can't change what you can't see. You can't change what you can't see. So I want you to think for a moment. It's Monday morning. You've had a spectacular weekend. You have definitely eaten too much, drunk too much, and possibly, for some of the unreformed, smoked too much. Come Monday morning, what's the first thing you want to do as your hand runs over your slightly protruding belly? Or you stand in front of a mirror and think, geez, my thighs are a bit more dimply than I'd like them to be. Or you walk up the first tiny set of stairs uh, at the train station or to work and, <coughs> oh, geez, I shouldn't smoke. Or you peer at your nose in the mirror and you think to yourself, gee, am I starting to get broken veins on my nose? Am I really starting to drink too much? Anyway, that happens. Have any of you noticed that moment of great reform on a Monday? Yeah, it's always on a Monday. Curiously, by Tuesday or Wednesday, you don't want what you wanted on Monday. In fact, for some of you, it started Monday afternoon. But for many of us, the shift back to old patterns of behaviour begins on a Wednesday. Thursday, Monday has long gone. And in fact, on Friday, you're hanging to have a good time on the weekend. And it's back again. Now, the reason why that change doesn't occur, and incidentally, a global $3 billion diet industry makes money out of this, is that most of us, when we take up exercise, try to give up smoking or stop drinking or eat less, don't have any other intention than in the moment managing momentary guilt, momentary anxiety or worry. Now, I highlight that for you today, not because I want to pick up on the issue of what we personally deal with, but to tell you something appalling about the gender issue. Everywhere I go, and I've been doing this for 30 years, I observe that the issue of promoting women into senior leadership roles in our world is stuck. You cannot change what you cannot see. So just digest some of these so these are statistics, as you watch them cast across the screen, that you should be familiar with. And my experience is everywhere I talk, anywhere in the world that I go, any form of leadership development that I do, these statistics are well known. Yet the reality is women are disappearing at the top in their droves. Uh, women are experiencing repetitiously benevolent sexism. Uh, for instance, women need mentoring. Did you know that? Well, actually, you know, women don't need mentoring any more than men need mentoring. Uh, when we talk about workplace prejudice, if you have children and you are going for a job as a woman, versus a man going for exactly the same job, you will experience recruitment bias. And even if you do get selected, probability is you will be paid 17% less for what you do. Now, that alone should make us angry. And today, it makes me really angry. I watch those drummers. Oh, Lord, what would you give for their tummy muscles? <laughs> I mean, are you going to go home and get a chair between your legs and give it a shot? <laughs> oh, really? I work out a lot, but I'm going to give that a shot. And, you know, that fantastic thump. You know, didn't you want to get some weights out and demonstrate that you're strong? Didn't that happen? Didn't you get this rush of girl power? And as I got that, I was sitting over there, because, of course, I always want to go to pee at the wrong moment. As I got that rush of girl power, I got really angry. I got angry because it's so devalued in our world. It is so monumentally devalued. The strength that women have in their bodies, four-fifths of the labour. So just stop complaining about work. You've always done four-fifths of the labour. You're gifted at it. You can do it. 
And then something magic happened and Hummingbird highlighted this for me. There is this deep, overwhelming compassion that women more naturally predispose, not because men don't love, because they do in abundance, but simply because in our hearts we care for children, we care for the elderly. And if we don't care, what will happen to our planet? So I want to show you something. <clears throat> Does this offend you? It offended me. I found this photo, you know, it's fantastic Google images. I wanted something jarring. And I look at that photo and I think, what offends you most when you look at the photo? Is it his fact that he's sightless, digitally enhanced? Or is it that he's got a cigarette in his mouth and he's a young dude? Think back into the 30s, 40s and 50s. And if I had shown that photo, you tell me what, what would have been most offensive to people looking at that picture? Or jarring? The, his sight. Isn't that interesting? So what has happened in the last 50 years? We have learned something terribly important. And the thing we have learned is that fundamentally, smoking is bad for you. We have come to see the consequences of smoking. Whether it's cancer, whether it's poor circulation, we have come to know that smoking actually is bad for you. And I promise you, if I said to you, don't smoke because it's bad for you, you'll keep smoking. You have to see why smoking is bad for you before you will change. 50 years ago, Dad would go uh, out on the weekend, he'd have the kids in the car, he would throw them in the back of the ute, he would uh, uh, go off to the pub, have a few drinks, give them a packet of Smith's chips, come out, they'd all be asleep, he's had a few pints, fags a few smokes, drives them home. Nothing would have happened. Today, quite rightly, if he got caught, he'd be uh, fined and possibly imprisoned for a crime that we now consider intolerable. Okay, get ready for this. What do you think of the blokes? Gorgeous, aren't they? <laughs> lovely bunch of men. Okay, they are a lovely bunch of men circa 1950. And these are a team of somewhat predictable leaders. Now, in the last 30 years, despite constant conversation about changing our world, about recognising the place of women, about honouring the fact, for instance, that having children is our collective responsibility. When did we come to believe that you had to go back into suburbia to have children? When did we come to believe that you could not bring your kids to work? Who said we can't bring our children to work? For 150,000 years, we have worked with our children beside us. And we made better, children, uh, better decisions when our kids were with us because we thought about our future. We made better decisions when old people were in our workplaces because we thought about our legacy. When did we come to believe that having children at work was not appropriate? And when do we actually buy into the notion of maternity leave as being a solution to children? Now, I'm not saying maternity leave's bad or that some women don't want to work with children at work. I'm saying it's not the dominant choice. It shouldn't be the dominant choice. But guess what? In 20 years of concerted effort, we've managed to change it to that. The current estimate is, and I see this every day of my working life, 100 to 300 years before we get effective change. Now, we need to own that as women, the power of the drummers, the power of hummingbird, and incidentally, a mortality rate uh, or murder uh, caused by women sits at about 15%, and the percentage of women who cause infanticide is small. And it's not to say it isn't a topic to talk about, but it's not all of you, necessarily. So put the statistic in its rightful place. So know that this change has happened agonisingly slowly. And these blokes actually think they're doing the right thing. And they're doing it for the wrong reason. They're doing it because they think it's fair. And fairness fundamentally does not change the world. It can be an important value, no question. Fairness, truth, integrity, honour, compassion, these are all worthy values. But values do not change our world. They just don't. So while we talk about fairness, we are trapped as women in what I call the problem-solution dance. Problem, solution, problem, solution. And the problem is we are solving the wrong problem. 
We keep coming up with superficial answers to serve a change and the change is not occurring. And what we deeply need every woman in this room, every woman of influence to start to do is to ask a very simple question. Why exactly should men and women lead in equal measure? Instead of saying because it's fair, we start saying because our planet won't make it if we don't. The only longitudinal study done on leadership capabilities, uh, quoted in the June edition of Harvard Business Review blog, quotes 16 well-known leadership capabilities and 15 of those capabilities, women excel over men. The only one, get the singular nature of purpose that men excel at, is strategy. Set a direction. We make it home. And home isn't just home for the unwell for the needy. Home is for all of us. Home is about the planet, the respect for how and where we live, and it is in dire straits. And everywhere I go, every executive team I work with, I see the loss of women. Not because we're the same, but because we're different. So, a little suggestion for you, an easy thing I'm going to say to do. We need to stop going for token solutions, and we need to get teams of men and women together starting with the most senior, and I would help any woman or man in the room who thought to do this, start at the table and say, why exactly do we want men and women in equal measure? Not because it's fair, but what is our vision? What would men do and do differently to encourage women to stay, and what would women do and do differently to stay, and then trial it? Vision without action is simply dreaming. Action with vision changes the world. Thank you.